Watch this. Their goal to go home was sort of set for last Friday, and they kind of did. Kind of. Today, the unofficial review from Democrats and Republicans about the unofficial ending to the legislative session. Their discussion wrapped up with a deep debate over money for libraries. That money was apparently earmarked for something else, but there was a deeper cause at the root of last week's late night conclusion. And if you visited the State House, you've likely seen the cannon on the Capitol lawn. Well, we're revisiting the history of that cannon after we were <coughs> corrected on its combustible chronicles. We were told from the beginning the goal for lawmakers was to get out before the end of March. And as we got closer to that deadline, we heard, well, even more finalized the last full week, probably, which ended last week. That was going to be the go home date. Well, technically, they could still get out by the end of March because they didn't officially adjourn last Friday, despite their best efforts to do so late Friday night. Well, best effort may be debatable, which we'll get into in a moment. So now it's Thursday when lawmakers are expected to wrap it up officially. Lawmakers finished up their business in the early hours of Saturday, passing budgets and the remaining bills. Lawmakers are waiting until Thursday to go home so they can act on any vetoes possibly handed down by Governor Little. Long story short, the business is basically done for the year. So what will they do until then? Eh. We do know Idaho Democrats hosted their session ending news conference today where they hit on the highs and lows of the year from their perspective. One overarching issue, time spent on divisive social issues, the law can't really solve, especially at the end of the session. Marks the culmination of a very dangerous trend we've seen in this body. Um, we have a House GOP caucus that has truly lost its way from conservative small government. That caucus now prefers to fixate on imaginary divisive social issues that are ginned up on Fox News, and they focus on those to the near exclusion of the very real issues that actually face Idahoans, issues like lack of affordable housing, skyrocketing property taxes, lack of affordable child care, direly underfunded education systems and teacher recruitment problems. And far from advocating for traditional conservative values like local control or a government that stays out of people's business, this Idaho House Geo Caucus now veers toward command and control regulation of everything from the bedroom to the boardroom. Yeah, some pretty strong criticism from House Minority Leader Democrat Alana Rebell. Meanwhile, from the other side of the aisle, House Speaker Scott Bedke says debate on those social issues is an important part of American politics. And despite the sidetracks, many GOP lawmakers feel they had a successful year. There are parts of the world that those never come up. And I think that that's just an indicator of the, of the free society that we live in, where we can have this exchange of ideas and not have to worry about, you know, you know day, life and death type issues. We, we passed a historic tax cut we made historic investments back into our public school systems. We made historic investments into our roads and bridges and our water infrastructure statewide. And then I think that we set up a responsible budget within the bounds of this year. Uh, we, we made re in responsible investments of the federal money in ways that will benefit Idaho in the long run. We paid off all of our debts. We, uh, we addressed all of our deferred maintenance issues. Okay, so if you're running your stopwatch at home, that was 50 seconds each, so both sides equal time. Of course, we expect to hear more later this week when the Idaho Republicans hold their official end of the session news conference. All right, back to the unofficial ending and what kept them up so late into the end of last week. The final act focused on libraries and the budget for the Commission for Libraries. Joe Paris joins us now. I mean, the, you look at that and go, library budgets, really? How did this become a late session buzzword or in some cases a buzz kill? What was the end result with this and why? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that too because I heard a lot of side conversations out at Treat for it, people discussing what possibly went on there. So if you're having one of those side conversations this weekend, here's your answer. Late on Friday night, the fifth version of the Commission for Libraries budget finally passed and it included the cut of federal ARPA dollars to the tune of about three and a half million dollars. And that money would have gone towards telehealth access projects for rural areas. Now, some lawmakers have said that they simply could not support taking and using those federal dollars. 
The final budget that passed also had a cut of $300,000 that would have been used for an Idaho ebook program for K through 12 students, but both of those written out of the final bill. Democrat lawmakers maintain today that they believe that the cut is punitive, a punishment, so to speak, against librarians who spoke out on House Bill 666. Now, HB 666, you may recall, it would have removed the obscenity ex ex exemption for public schools, libraries, and museums, which are and continue to be exempt from Idaho's harmful materials laws. After hours of debate and redrafting legislation and some private behind the scenes conversations, as well as some math, lawmakers passed the Commission for Libraries budget, but that was not the end, oh no. The Idaho House also debated a resolution on Friday to create a study group to look at materials in libraries and the extent of obscene or harmful books and content available, specifically to minors. Here's a look at the debate and conclusion lawmakers came to late Friday, again on a study group that would study what is happening in Idaho libraries, specifically what minors have access to. Late into the night Friday, Idaho lawmakers discussed the notion that Idaho minors are accessing obscene and harmful materials in Idaho libraries. There is material that is defined in our state code as being harmful to children, harmful to minors, that continues to be accessed in the shelves of our libraries. Eagle Representative Gayanne de Mordon is the sponsor of House Resolution 23, a move in part to establish a working group to examine materials harmful to minors in libraries and K-12 schools. Republican lawmakers explain their stance in view of what they believe is happening in Idaho. This is about our children and our grandchildren and my real concern is we're losing them to evil. Some of these books, books were brought to my attention and um, I didn't even understand the law, but what we have right now is pornography is illegal and you can't give pornography to kids. You can't even have child pornography, but it's in these books. It's in, it's in a lot of these books. Some lawmakers clearly shifted blame to librarians that they believe are not protecting children from harmful materials. This comes in reference to pushback from some librarians about the now dead House Bill 666, a bill that would have removed the obscenity exemption for public schools, libraries, and museums. At least for some librarians out there, they are more concerned about the well-being of librarians in their professional careers than they are about the welfare of children and the potential harm done to them if we move anywhere from the status quo of what's going on in libraries or schools or universities or museums. Idaho Democrats were quick to push back, saying that the demonization of libraries and librarians is based on a story that is not really accurate. It's a false narrative to suggest that obscene materials are all over in our libraries. They aren't. You might be able to find one or two examples that make certain members of our communities uncomfortable, but this is a false narrative. False. Absolutely false. Democrat Representative James Ruckty made the case that lawmakers were being punitive, punishing librarians who spoke out on House Bill 666. When librarians and library boards get their backs up and say it's a false narrative, they're accused uh, with another false narrative that now they're defending this bad practice of having obscene materials and exposing kids to those obscene materials. Some pushed back, saying it's not a false narrative at all. It is not a false narrative. This is going on in libraries in the state of Idaho. I had a colleague of ours that was, was uh, talking to another colleague about this issue. He said, well, let's pull up this book and let's see if it's available in your library in the under five section. He pulled it up. It's there. He said, do you want to see the images? Colleague said, is it pornographic? He said, yeah. He goes, no, I don't want to see it. Representative Chris Mathias made a point about who to blame when it comes to children and obscene material. If three-year-olds and five-year-olds are going into libraries in Idaho and getting their hands on these materials, parents are failing at a level that no legislature can fix. After extended debate, the resolution passed, paving the way for a study group focused on harmful materials in libraries in Idaho.
So the House resolution that we talked about a moment ago, that was just to, you know, the idea to set up the study group. Well, we've learned today that the Idaho Senate, they're also on board with the study group. So that will be a full thing that is expected to host a lot of stakeholders. Democrats and Republicans are supposed to be on this study group. And the Commission for Libraries and Librarians are supposed to be all a part of this. So we'll be watching that come down the pike uh, really in the next several months. It will probably look a lot like the interim look into critical race theory in school. We, We'll be able to follow this very closely. One thing, though, Brian, I just want to add while we're on the legislative topic, um, the Coronavirus Pause Act. Which I was just asking about that because Representative Rebell said, yeah, from the bedroom to the boardroom. The boardroom leads us to this. Yes, that's right. Okay. So the Coronavirus Pause Act, which we've talked about at length here on the 208, long story short, it would have basically given certain restrictions on um, uh, having a, a vaccine for employees and also having a vaccine in order to enter certain places. Mm -hmm. Well, Governor Little a short time ago has vetoed that. So that is not going to go on the books. There is one more option for lawmakers. They could override the veto hypothetically. We'll see if they do that on Thursday. There's a question on if the numbers are there to override it. You need two thirds of both houses, so it's wait and see. But the Coronavirus Pause Act, which did have a lot of support in the state house, was vetoed a short time ago by the governor. All right. Thank you very much. I know we've talked about these libraries and librarians for weeks now since this really became a topic that we didn't expect to become a topic here this legislative session. So the official story of the library's allocation bills we just heard can be threaded through the failure of House Bill 666 and the subsequent House Resolution 23, both legislation sponsored by Representative Guyanne de Mornon. The former referred to as mischief by Senate pro tem Chuck Winder, and it died in Senate committee. That would be House Bill 666. The latter passed the House Friday with a 50 vote advantage. That would be the resolution. Quoting the Idaho Constitution, it did, and its bedrock principle that, quote, the first concern of all good government is the virtue and sobriety of the people, end quote, and how the state constitution directs the Idaho legislature to enact policies that promote temperance and morality. Think about that. It even quotes the U.S. Supreme Court case, the United States versus American Library Association, where it ruled states have a compelling government interest in protecting young library users from material inappropriate for minors, and how parents should reasonably expect their children will not encounter harmful materials while at the library. Well, during the House floor debate over House Bill 666, there was a packet passed around containing examples of, quote, books available to children and youth in school and in public libraries in Idaho, which meet the legal definition of being harmful to minors, end quote. The first on this list, a book called Gender Queer, a memoir written in 2019 by Maya Kobabi. So we decided to look into this a bit to see where this book, in which libraries this book might be available to minors, which is why I had the question, I wonder which book Representative Crane was speaking about last Friday that he found in the under five section. Don't know. We talked about this before with the Ada Community Library about three weeks ago, about this book specifically. We learned then it is one book out of their 200,000 materials in their library. And they've only had it since February 14th of this year. It is categorized, carried, and stacked in the adult graphic novel section. Emphasis on adult, so it's not really technically available to children. It has been checked out there three times, including currently. How many times has it been requested for reconsideration, meaning someone asked to have it removed? Zero. The Boise Public Library has had three copies that were added to circulation back in December of last year. They keep it in the adult nonfiction section since it is a memoir. Their copies have been checked out 13 times with 15 people waiting on the hold request list. Could it be because of the attention this book has received over the last few weeks? Maybe. For some perspective, the Boise Public Library checked out nearly 2.5 million physical and digital items in a year's time, from October 2020 to September 2021. Over that same period, they added nearly 45,000 unique physical and digital titles to their collection a selection made by a committee of five librarians. And they have had no requests for reconsideration submitted to the library over that time for any of those books. We did learn Centennial High School in the West Ada School District, they did have a copy of Gender Queer in its library. But after a reconsideration request, it has recently been removed. We did ask the Boise Public Library if during this legislative session, any lawmakers happened to reach out and ask them about their collection and how it is handled. We were told a few Senate and House members did reach out to them to see how their collection development team selects materials for the library and how the process for reconsideration reviews works with the staff, the management, and the Board of Trustees. A few reached out. 
Maybe about as many as there are copies of Gender Queer on the library adult shelves. Maybe. By the way, between books and movies, I looked on the website. There are 57 copies of the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise available at the Boise Public Library. You know, the canon on the Capitol lawn, it's a lot of mystery to it. Some we originally thought to be pure speculation, but we've been corrected. So another revision is necessary to our telling of its history. You know, we love to hear from you. A lot of stories stem from your comments or questions you send in. One of those about kites missing from a Boise park. So lock this number into your contacts list, 208-321-5614. That's how you can be part of the 208 conversation. Text us about anything we've talked about here on the 208. We want to see your clean, concise, and clever messages. And don't forget to include your name and the hashtag the 208. We could share yours at the end of the show.
All right, stepping away from the legislative talk for just the moment, Brian Graber sent us this email. What happened to the kites in the kinetic kite sculpture in the Block Cancer Survivor Memorial in Julie Davis Park? Well, we reached out to the City of Boise Arts and History Department. That sculpture is called Wind Dance, and it was installed back in 2014. Turns out the kites are missing. They say the structural, uh, are not missing, I should say. They are, well, they were removed. They were structural damage caused by heavy snowfall. So they've been temporarily taken down for repairs. So that's what happened with those. So if you have any good questions about those, please send them in. Good news, they're expected to be back up in a few weeks after they make said repairs. So that's the good news. All right, well, last week, we broke down the history of the Capitol Cannon. You may remember that. The 1845 model Seacoast gun that was donated and mounted on the Southwest Lawn in 1910. It was kind of like a, a game of two truths and a lie, since there was a lot about the cannon that was either misunderstood or just all out wrong. For example, for years, the cannon was said to be a model 1840, but it's actually a model 1845, which is an important distinction for Seacoast gun aficionados. There's also a plaque on the side of the cannon that claims it was used in the 1863 siege of Vicksburg, Mississippi during the Civil War. However, Idaho's Department of Administration, who is in charge of the Capitol grounds, told us the cannon is certainly from the Civil War era, and it did spend some time in Vicksburg, but the cannon's combat service record could not be confirmed. It claims to have been donated by Senator William Bora and State Treasurer C.A. Hastings. However, the level of Hastings' involvement, eh, Somewhat debatable, according to those in charge. Then there was the reason for the barrel being filled with concrete. This, however, was another point of contention where I admit I kind of missed the point on this one. I asked the Capitol Curator with the Idaho State Historical Society about the rumors of it being, quote, unofficially fired off at times over the years. There were two stories from the 30s and 40s when it was packed with gunpowder and debris and then fired, doing damage to nearby buildings and cars. Then there was another story about the barrel being used as a drop point for bootleggers during Prohibition. And on a hot day outside, well, it overheated and the bottle inside exploded. Well, the curator told us that story couldn't be proven. But I kind of understood her to mean that none of those stories could be proven. So my mistake, it turns out there was some archival evidence to the former. March 6th, 1932, the Sunday morning edition of the Idaho Statesman declared a blast from Statehouse Cannon wakens drowsy Boise residents. Old US number 79, they wrote, came to life at 1136 Saturday night and treated Boise to the biggest noise the capital city has heard in many a day. Who loaded the old gun or why could not be learned that night by police. But they did discover the cannon had been charged with a stick of black powder, which apparently had enough kick to send debris clear to Jefferson Street. Then the next day, March 7th, students suspected, the statesman said. The update, Boise High students jubilant over the school's big basketball win over Caldwell in the district tournament were believed to have put that black powder in the cannon. Because many believe the occasion deserves some sort of celebration, so long as no damage was done. About that, there just happened to be a man getting into his car, which happened to be parked in a direct line with the cannon's gaping mouth. The man heard the blast, and then his car was hit with a mass of sticks, stones, broken glass and other debris. He told police, the next time I go to the theater, I'll not park my car in front of a cannon. Then on May 23rd, 1946, speculating if it was the opening of someone's political campaign, pranksters set off State House Cannon. Boise police said six or seven kids put black powder in the cannon and touched off an explosion that shook the State House and Hotel Boise windows. No damage done. But again, a debris field of rocks, sticks, and bottles sprayed across the Capitol lawn. So there are your two corrected truths about the exploding Capitol cannon. Okay, so as for the remaining mystery, whether during Prohibition in the 20s, that bottle of hooch hidden in the barrel burst because the cast iron heated up on a very hot day, that, that still unconfirmed. Then again, who would have owned up to it back then, right? Regardless, to prevent it from being packed with more black powder, Grounds crew packed it with concrete sometime in the 50s. Thank you to historian Rick Just for helping us set the record straight.
All right, a lot of text this afternoon about this straw man argument that the legislature is putting out there about libraries and pornography available to children. Like this one from Karen. How many five-year-old kids are consciously aware of and searching for a memoir on gender identity? Sounds like another opportunity of LGBTQ suppression in Idaho, she says. This one here. Why isn't law enforcement seizing the illegal pornographic materials from public libraries, asked Pam in Grandview. Well, as it is right now, which is what the basis of, of House Bill 666 was about, libraries are exempt from pornographic laws, but we were told weeks ago they do subscribe to the Miller test, which looks at things as a case based in 1973 set out the standards for that, which would be community standards, artistic value, that kind of stuff, and they do adhere to that, so they try not to put any porno porno pornography on their shelves anyway. Why are librarians responsible? Shouldn't parents be the ones checking on what their children are taking out of the library, asked Kelly. Very good question. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.